Ethics is a branch of philosophy that explores questions about morality, values, and principles governing human behavior. It seeks to provide a framework for determining what is right and wrong, and how individuals and societies should act in various situations. The philosophy of ethics addresses fundamental questions such as meta-ethics, applied ethics, and normative ethics. This video will provide an overview of the central questions of meta-ethics, a breakdown of the different theories of normative ethics, and some examples of problems within the field of applied ethics. Ethical philosophy is a diverse and evolving field with ongoing debates among philosophers about the nature of ethics and the best approaches to resolving moral dilemmas. Ethical theories provide tools for individuals and society to critically examine their values, make ethical decisions, and consider the implications of their actions on others and the world at large. Ultimately, ethics plays a crucial role in guiding human behavior, fostering moral responsibility, and promoting a just society. Shoulder, Angel. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm gonna lead you down the path that rocks. I'll come off it. You come off it. You. 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 You infinity. Ah. Listen up, big guy. I got three good reasons why you should just walk away. Number one. Look at that guy. He's got that sissy stringy music thing. We've been through this. It's a harp, and you know it. All right. That's a harp. And that's a dress. Robe. Reason number two. Look what I can do. <laughs> what? What does that have to do with him? No, no. He's got a point. Listen, you guys. You're sort of confusing me, so, uh, be gone. Uh, or, uh, you know, however I get rid of you guys. That'll work. All right, so as I mentioned in my introductory to philosophy video, philosophy as a discipline can be broken up into distinct categories or areas of research, areas of study. In that video, we talked about logic, metaphysics, epistemology, and of course, what we're going to talk about today, which is the study of ethics. And each of those areas that I just mentioned cover distinct questions concerning life, knowledge, the afterlife, and ethics specifically deals with this question, and I'm going to kind of summarize Aristotle here. So ethics begins with this question of how should I live my life? Or another way to phrase that, in what manner should I live my life? What are the general guidelines, principles, values that I'm going to utilize to structure my life and to make choices? And ethics is, in that way, probably the most practical branch of philosophy, because it's the branch of philosophy that everybody uses. Sometimes when I talk about things like metaphysics or ontology, or I just released my videos on the philosophy of time, for most people, that doesn't really mean a whole lot because, yeah, maybe they thought about time. I mean, you think about time every day in terms of when you have to be to work or to school or anything like that. But in terms of ethics, I don't really have to argue with you about the practical importance of ethics because you, no matter who you are, who is listening to this, make ethical choices and decisions on an everyday basis. Everybody does ethics, whether they realize they're doing ethics or not, because all of us on a daily basis are faced with moral choices that we have to make. You have to make moral choices if you're alive. If you're living for any extended period of time in society or even by yourself, there's going to come a time in your daily activity where you have to make a moral choice. And we'll talk about those specific moral choices or a branch of ethics that we're going to talk about called applied ethics. But I just want to start off by giving a general overview of where ethics fits in philosophy. And like the other branches of philosophy that we talked about, metaphysics, aesthetics, logic, Ethics is kind of intimately tied into those other branches in that you can't really do ethics, for example, without talking about logic. And you can't do ethics, or I should say you can't do certain types of ethics if you want to talk about without talking about aesthetics. And this leads to the big difference between how ethics is talked about kind of by quote unquote, everyday people, not to say that philosophers are anything special, but if, for example, you were to approach somebody on the street and you start talking about like what is morally 
right and wrong. For a lot of people, morality is something that is culturally, individually, ethnically subjective. And a lot of people nowadays would say that what is morally right or wrong is just based on a matter of one's preference. And so the concept of philosophical ethics seems foreign to a lot of people because in philosophy, if it was just about an individual's subjective preference for what is right and wrong, then there would be no basis for conversation. If I believe that morality is just inherently subjective to my own thoughts and feelings, then I wouldn't really see a need to engage with anybody about what their attitudes are or what their actions or how their actions are affecting me. Philosophy, as I said before in that introduction video, is a search for a critical understanding of the world around us through the process of critical thinking and critical discussion. What that means in terms of ethics is that our conversation about ethics in this context is going to be predicated on certain assumptions of rationality, the use of logic, and a discussion of sort of the metaphysical principles that are underlying our conversation. So ethics within philosophy does not just boil down to a matter of opinion. What I mean by all of that is that within philosophy, to posit an ethical choice as either being right or wrong requires levels of justification, whether that justification is the coming in the form of a rational justification, making sure that your argument is logically sound, or even empirical evidence to support your position. So in terms of applied philosophy, applied ethics, if you want to make the case, for example, that eating meat, eating animals is morally wrong, part of your justification for doing that might be that it's morally wrong because animals experience suffering and we shouldn't inflict suffering on something in order to consume its flesh. And part of your evidence to support that animals experience suffering might be empirical evidence and empirical data to show that that is in fact the case. So ethics within philosophy re requires diverse forms of justification, whether we're talking about logical argumentation, empirical evidence, you can even factor in stuff like soci sociological or psychological studies in order to support your ethical position. And that being said, in philosophy, there are good ethical arguments and there are bad ethical arguments and certain ethical positions can be wrong. In other words, if we're engaging in philosophical discussion, it's not just a matter of personal preference, although some philosophers will argue that ethics is inherently relative, but they're going to do so on a rational basis. It's different from the conversation of ethics being relative for the person on the street, so to speak. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so within ethics, we can break it down into three positions. That is three different categories or three different areas of ethics. We have meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. Meta-ethics examines, and we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail throughout this video, but meta-ethics examines the nature and the origin of ethical concepts and language. Meta-ethics asks questions about whether or not moral statements are objective or subjective and explores issues like moral realism, the beliefs that objective moral facts exist, and moral anti-realism, the belief that morality is subjective or a matter of individual opinion, going back to that relativism that I just talked about. So that the, the question of whether or not ethics is inherently relative to the individual would be a meta-ethical question. Now, all of these inherently relate to each other in some way, shape, or form, but not necessarily. In other words, you can be a moral realist. You can believe that moral facts exist and hold, for example, to a deontological position, but you can also be a moral anti-realist and still hold to a deontological position. So they are intertwined and interrelated, but there's some important differences between all of these. And it's best when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to figure out what exactly their ethical position is, is to clarify some of these concepts, but to keep in mind that we're talking about different categories. So that's Meta-ethics. Speaking of deontology, so normative ethics provides guidelines for determining what actions are morally right or wrong. It includes various ethical theories that propose principles and criteria for ethical decision making. We'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, but the prominent moral theories include deontological ethics, utilitarian, 
virtue ethics, and rights-based ethics. There are several more, of course, but for the sake of simplicity and time, we'll keep it limited to those. And then finally, we have applied ethics. Now, applied ethics deals with specific ethical issues and dilemmas in various fields. This can be everything from issues related to medical ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, and bioethics. Applied ethics provides framework for addressing ethical questions and making morally sound decisions within these domains. And like I was saying before about how ethics utilizes critical thinking, logic, maybe even empirical evidence, within applied ethics, depending upon what area you're talking about, is also going to depend upon what sort of evidence is going to be relevant to the discussion there. Okay, so let's talk about, let's start off with meta-ethics. So meta-ethics is the branch of philosophy that explores the nature, origin, and meaning of ethical concepts and language. Unlike normative ethics, which focuses on determining what is morally right or wrong and providing guidelines for ethical behavior, meta-ethics takes a more abstract and foundational approach by examining the underlying structure of ethics itself. We have a couple of questions here by the philosophers Richard Garner and Bernard Rosen, who kind of summarize meta-ethics in terms of how you answer these three questions. The first question being, what is the meaning of moral judgments or terms? One central question in meta-ethics is whether or not moral statements express objective facts, subjective feelings, or something else entirely, maybe psychological moods or states of the brain or something along those lines. In other words, if I tell you that an action is good, what is that word good referring to? Is it referring to an objective state that exists in the world or the universe somewhere? Are moral facts real in the same way that other metaphysical facts might be real? Or when I say good, am I talking about a matter of personal preference or maybe a state, a mood, or emotion that I'm currently experiencing? What exactly are these terms referring to? That's kind of what we're doing when we're asking about the meanings of words such as good, bad, right, or wrong in the context of ethics. So if I use the phrase, for example, that lying is wrong, do I mean that lying is wrong based on some sort of objective moral standard? And we'll talk about objectivity here in a second. But I, do I mean that like universally speaking? Or do I mean that lying's wrong for you? So what exactly are these terms referring to? And this ties into that second question, what is the nature of moral judgments? So asking about the nature of moral judgments gets us into this question of moral realism. Now in philosophy, moral realism is this meta-ethical theory that morality is a quote-unquote real feature of the world. And what do I mean by real is that morality exists in the same way that other metaphysical entities such as like God would exist. And in fact, that connection's pretty strong. Most religious practitioners, at least of the big three monotheistic religions, would be moral realist in the sense that they would believe that these moral ideas are in some way, shape, or form predicated on the existence or the being of God. That's not saying that you have to have God to be a moral realist because you can also be a moral realist who's a naturalist and believe that moral intuitions or moral facts are established and confirmed on some aspect of human society. So, so for example, if you accept the social contract theory and you believe that human beings, this is based off of the writings of the English philosophers Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, if you believe that human beings entered into society under the pretenses of certain agreements, that when we all came together, we all agreed to a certain basic set of rules and that these rules are the foundation of society itself, it's what keeps society itself together, then you can make the argument that morality is founded upon that and it's objective in the sense that it's applicable to every human being who's living in society. So moral realists argue that moral facts are objective, that in some way, shape, or form, either they're applicable to human beings as a species, as a whole, or even transcend human beings and are founded somewhere sort of out there. So another example of this would, of course, be Plato's theory of the forms. Plato believed that morality is objective 
because we have this sense of morality that's grounded in this transcendent realm. And in this respect, moral beliefs and moral facts would be independent of our subjective feelings about them. So for example, is it morally right to murder somebody? The answer to that question would be independent or separate from what your individual personal feelings about murder are. Moral anti-realist, on the other hand, would argue that there is is no foundation or basis for morality in like physical reality that morality is invented so to speak by human beings and is therefore not objective in the same way that other like empirical facts would be objective that there's a big distinction and difference between the two and so the third question here how do we know whether or not moral judgments can be supported or defended? On what basis are we going to support moral judgments? And this gets back to that question of evidence that I was talking about earlier. And this explores the relationship between ethics as a discipline and epistemology. How do we know that the claims that we're making about ethics are right or wrong? What basis or standard are we going to utilize in order to make ethical arguments? Is it going to be logic? Are we going to take into consideration empirical facts? Are we going to take into consideration subjective experiences? What exactly is going to be play a factor or a role in the arguments that we're making? So overall, metaethics provides a theoretical framework for understanding the nature of ethics itself. It doesn't prescribe specific moral principles or tell us what is right or wrong. Rather, metaethics helps us to explore and understand the foundations and implications of ethical discourse, providing valuable insights into how we talk about, think about, and engage with ethics and ethical discussions. Okay, so we talked about metaethics. The next major subdivision of ethics is normative ethics. Normative ethics is a branch of ethics that deals with questions of how people ought to act in a given situation or what actions and behaviors are morally right or morally wrong. It seeks to provide a framework for evaluating and guiding human conduct by establishing certain principles, rules, or criteria for de determining what is morally permissible, obligatory, or even morally forbidden. Normative ethics is concerned with prescribing and evaluating moral norms and standards that ought to guide our behavior. And within normative ethics, like I said before, we have these different ethical theories. Now, you can kind of view ethic theory and ethics in the same way that you can view theories in science in the sense that these are supposed to be large-scale theoretical frameworks that are supposed to help us understand specific things. And in this case, understand whether or not specific actions to, to be guides to whether or not specific actions are right or wrong. And briefly, I have four listed here, and each one of these ethical theories, I could probably spend an entire video. I mean, people write entire books on just aspects of deontological ethics, for example. So these are really deep topics. I'm just going to give a surface level overview of each of these. If you're interested in one of them that I mentioned, I would highly suggest the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy it has some excellent entries on each one of these. I'll link both of those websites in the description of this video if you're interested. So what I'm going to cover is deontological ethics, consequentialism in the form of utilitarianism, virtue ethics, and rights-based ethics. So first of all, we have deontology. Now, deontology focuses on the inherent nature of actions themselves rather than the consequences of actions. It asserts that certain actions are inherently right or wrong, regardless of that action's outcomes. In other words, choices cannot be justified by their effects. That no matter how morally good the consequences of an action, it's the choice about the action itself that's going to determine the morality of that action. Probably the most famous deontologist within the history of philosophy is undoubtedly in the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who developed his famous categorical imperative, is, a, is probably the best well-known example of deontological ethical theory. And Kant, and Kant says, and this is a direct quote, 
that we ought to act as if the maximums of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. In other words, when you're trying to decide whether or not you should do an action, you should consider that whatever choice you decide to make, that that choice would become a universal law, that all humans would act in the same way that you act in that context. And what this means is that what makes a choice right is its conformity with that norm that you are setting. Such norms are to be simply obeyed by each and every moral agent. A prime example of this would be honesty. So oftentimes a tricky situation that people like to ask is whether or not lying is morally right. And I'm sure if I were to ask you to think of some scenarios in which lying might be morally justified, you could easily come up with several of those. But a deontologist, when approaching the question, is lying morally right or wrong? The answer to that is, would be, for example, I could argue from a deontological perspective that lying is morally wrong and that lying's always wrong. It doesn't matter if I'm telling a little white lie. Maybe I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, right? The classic example of this is you're with your partner and your partner asks, how do I look today? And maybe they look horrible. A deontologist would say you would have to tell that person the truth because lying's always wrong. Another example of this that has become famous within Kantian ethics is what's called the murderer at the door. This example says that you hear a ring on your doorbell one night, you go to the door, somebody's there, they're panicky, they say that a murderer is chasing after them, can they hide in your house until he passes? You say yes, go hide in the closet, so the person goes and hides in your closet. 30 minutes later, you get another knock at your door, you go to the door, and it's the knife-wielding murderer, and the knife-wielding murderer says, hey, did somebody come by here recently? Did you see somebody running? Did somebody ask to hide here? And a deontologist, I mean, this is a dramatic oversimplification, and Kant actually directly addresses this at various points, but again, you can reference those articles that I've mentioned for a more detailed analysis of this, but a deontologist would say, no, you you have to tell the truth, right? You have to rat out the person hiding. Theoretically, again, this is very big picture. The point here is that according to deontology, the rightness or wrongness of an action is determined by that action's inherent nature and in that the rightness or wrongness cannot be influenced by the outcome, that what is right has to be right regardless of the consequences that it brings. Speaking of consequences, this leads us to our next major theory, consequentialism. Probably the most famous example of a consequentialist theory of ethics would be utilitarian. I'm going to kind of use those a little synonymously here, but again, if you want to get into the weeds, into the distinctions there, those articles will be super helpful. So consequentialist ethics evaluates actions based on their consequences. Most famous form, as I said before, is utilitarianism, which holds that the right action is the one that maximizes overall happiness or utility. Going back to that lying example, so is it okay to lie? The utilitarian would say that it depends on the context, it depends on the situation. For the murderer at the door example, if the murderer is asking you, is the person hiding in your house? Well, the utilitarian would say, well, of course it's okay to lie. You're literally saving somebody's life. According to John Stuart Mill, a famous utilitarian, Mill says, quote, all action is for the sake of some end and rules of action must take their whole character and color from that end. The rightness or wrongness of an action is directly correlated to whatever sort of consequence that action has. Morality is determined by general principles applied to specific instances in much the same way, Mill says, that specific actions are usually designed to produce some specific end. When we consider an action, we have an intended outcome in mind, an intended consequence in mind, and that consequence is going to determine whether or not that action is right or wrong. In this respect, people ought to act so as to maximize happiness. If we're thinking big picture here, if you're thinking about how your action affects everybody else in your community, your household, your nation, whatever, that we ought to act to maximize 
happiness or pleasure, and of course, to minimize unhappiness or to minimize pain. So both deontology and consequentialism is action-focused. Both are centered on specific ethical questions like, is lying wrong? Is murder wrong? That's what I mean by action-focused. The next moral theory I want to talk about, virtue ethics, it's kind of hard to conceptualize for some people, but it's non-action-focused, at least not, not focused on specific actions. So virtue ethics doesn't deal with the question of whether or not a particular action is right or wrong. Rather, rather, it focuses on the moral character of the individual. Virtue ethics emphasizes the development of virtuous character traits in individuals over and against focusing on the outcome or the inherent character of the action itself. Virtue ethics suggests that ethical behavior stems from cultivating virtues, such as honesty, courage, compassion. What these virtues are are going to depend upon which virtue ethicist we're talking about, whether we're talking about Aristotle, Confucius, or more recent iterations of virtue ethics by philosophers such as Alistair McIntyre or Anscombe, for example. It suggests that ethical behavior, Aristotle is probably considered by most philosophers, the founder of virtue ethics. So for a virtue ethicist, if they're considering like an, a, a virtue ethicist would ask, for example, is lying wrong? They would kind of rephrase that in such a way to say that like, would a virtuous person lie? Or is this something that a virtuous person would do? So again, the emphasis becomes not on the action itself, but rather on the individual performing that action. So virtue ethics is concerned with what it means to live a good life and what sort of persons should we be. And going back to that distinction, asking like what is the right action in a specific instance is different from asking the question, how should I live or what sort of person should I be? That first question deals with specific dilemmas and specific outcomes. The second question that the virtue ethicist is focused on is a question about the entire life of the individual or the character of the individual. What sort of person should I be rather than what should I do here in this specific instance. Now, deontological, consequentialism, virtue ethics all can trace their origins back to ancient philosophy. As I've said before, there are many different theories of ethics. A more recent one would be rights-based ethics. Rights-based ethics focuses on the inherent rights and dignity of individuals. Typically within a political context, rights-based ethics gets its start during the Enlightenment period with philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and is actually codified in different systems and structures of government during the American and the French Revolution. It argues that certain rights, such as the right to life or liberty or property, are fundamental and should not be violated. Probably the most famous example, one of the most famous examples of this comes from the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That human beings, by virtue of the fact that they are human, are entitled to and have certain rights. And so when determining whether or not something is morally right or wrong, we have to ask whether or not that individual's rights are being infringed upon or their rights being violated. So normative ethics does not provide specific answers to every moral dilemma, but rather offers a framework for ethical deliberation and decision-making. Again, systems like virtue ethics and rights-based ethics may not be able to answer specific questions of applied ethics, but it's just given us a, a, a conversation starter, a place to start, something to frame the conversation itself. Ethicists often engage in debates and discussion within these ethical frameworks to determine what actions are morally justified in various situations. It's essential to note that I've only provided a very brief overview and that some of these systems of ethics, such as virtue ethics, are going to vary widely depending upon what philosopher we're talking about, whether we're talking about Aristotle versus Confucius, ancient philosophy versus modern philosophy. This is just a 
very, very high level overview. So finally, we come to applied ethics. Applied ethics is the branch of ethics that deals with the practical applications, the practical decisions that we have to make in real world situations. While general or theoretical ethics explores fundamental questions about what is morally right and wrong, the nature of moral principles, applied ethics focuses on specific issues, controversies, and ethical challenges that arise within the various situations that life throws at us. So I listed four different divisions here. I mean, again, this is a, a simplification. Applied ethics can be, uh, it's its literally applied to with, with any context in, in human life. These are just some major areas of research and focus that have become prominent over the past 100 years or so. So First of all, we have bioethics. Bioethics examines the ethical issues surrounding medicine, healthcare, and the life sciences. This can include topics like euthanasia. Should people have the right to die? Is it morally permissible for somebody with some sort of terminal disease? Like, should that person have the ability to go to a hospital and essentially kill themselves? Should this be an option for elderly people who are on their deathbed so they don't have to suffer? Other issues like abortion would fall under this, organ transplants, genetic engineering, and every ethical problem related to healthcare, especially if we're talking about American healthcare, can follow under the general umbrella of bioethics. And hopefully you can already start to see how those ethical theories that we just talked about might have some sort of bearing or give us some sort of guidance when talking about these specific issues. Next, we have environmental ethics. This has become very popular recently. Environmental ethics explores ethical considerations related to the environment and the treatment of animals. This includes issues like what to do about climate change, conservations of certain natural resources and natural places, pollution, animal rights. Probably one of the most famous examples in environmental ethics is whether or not it's morally permissible to eat animals, to eat meat. One of the most well-known books about this is Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. If you're interested in that topic, I would highly recommend it. We have the ethics of technology, evaluating the ethical implications of technological advancements, including concerns surrounding privacy, artificial intelligence, data ethics, the impact of technology on society. This is a big one that I see a lot as an educator. What sort of impact, for example, is social media having on like teenagers? And there's a whole host of ethical questions surrounding that. So for example, at what age should children be allowed to use social media? If social media, and this is again, this is where you can like include things like sociological, empirical data, right? Because all the study and research that we've done have shown that social media is having a really adverse impact on young people, that it's overwhelmingly affecting them in a negative way. So the ethical question is, well, what exactly are we supposed to do about that? If it's, if it's hurting people, are we obligated to prevent those people from using it? Should we put certain restrictions? Should we put like enforce certain age limits on social media? Should we ban social media altogether? These are the sorts of questions that I'm talking about here. Finally, we have business ethics. Business ethics analyzes ethical questions in the context of business and corporate practices. This includes contexts like corporate social responsibility. Going back to that social media example, are these social media companies themselves somehow responsible? artificial intelligence, fair trade, ethical marketing, and workplace ethics. All that kind of falls under the general umbrella of business ethics. So applied ethics in this sense seeks to provide practical guidance and ethical frameworks for individuals, professionals, and organizations when facing complex moral decisions. It often involves a process of ethical reasoning, debate, and the development of guidelines or codes of conduct to help individuals and institutions navigate ethical terrain. Applied ethics, as I said before, may draw on various ethical theories and principles to analyze and provide ethical solutions to specific dilemmas in their respective fields. So as I said before, ethics is a really big and complicated field, kind of divided up into those three main areas, 
meta ethics, dealing with those sort of like big picture questions of moral realism, what exactly are ethical terms refer referring to. Then we have normative ethics that's going back to those theories of ethics, deontological, consequentialism, virtue ethics. And then lastly, we ended with a conversation about applied ethics. And again, applied ethics dealing with specific ethical questions. Is it okay to eat meat? Is it morally permissible to shop at places like Walmart? I mean, the list is endless, but hopefully that provided you with a good overview of what ethics is and what ethicists study. Ethics as a fundamental branch of philosophy serves as the cornerstone of our understanding of morality and the principles guiding human conduct. It encompasses a wide array of ethical theories, theories of normative ethics, offering diverse perspectives on moral evaluation. This discipline encourages critical reflection on complicated moral issues, stimulating individuals and society to scrutinize their values and actions, thus fostering a deeper comprehension of ethical implications. Applied ethics, that subfield that we ended the video with talking about, extends these principles to real world context, assisting individuals, professionals, and institutions in making ethical decisions. Furthermore, ethics possesses a rich historical and cultural significance, shaping societal norms and beliefs, while also engaging in ongoing debates that reflect the complexity of these dilemmas themselves. It is a dynamic field that evolves alongside societal changes, touching upon various other disciplines and playing a pivotal role in the formation of individual and collective moral frameworks. I hope that you enjoyed the content of this video. I would be very interested to hear your thoughts about the different ideas and categories of ethics talked about in this video. Let me know, for example, which moral theory you hold to, and I will see you all next time.